Welcome back to another episode. Uh, today we're going to be talking to Michael Monk, who is an 0302. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with an 0302 is, but an 0302 is an infantry officer in the Marine Corps. And I think this is going to be a valuable opportunity for anybody that's ever considered being in the infantry and leading Marines um, from an officer's perspective. So Michael, I appreciate you taking the time to come out here and uh, meet up with me and shed some some of your own personal experience and perspective on this. I think it's going to be valuable to anybody that's ever considered this. And if they don't know what it's like being an infantry officer or like what it, what an infantry officer does on a day-to-day basis, like I think that'll be valuable for them. So I appreciate you taking the time to yeah. come out here. Absolutely. I appreciate it. So like how do we, yeah, cool. absolutely. Uh, so where let's, let's start off. Where are you from originally? I'm from Houston, uh, Houston, okay. Texas, as far as raised, um, Went to Kingwood High School, was a swimmer there, so I was on varsity swim team for four years, and then went to Texas A&M University. Oh, nice. Didn't pursue swimming. Uh, joined the Corps of Cadets at Texas A&M. Okay. Did that for four years. I uh, en- ended up being the commanding officer of my unit in the Corps of Cadets, which is pretty cool. Nice. Graduated, went to o- OCS after I graduated, and then TBS, IOC. Yeah, here. the whole shebang. Yeah. So w- what did you major in when you were in college? Industrial distribution. So okay. it's kind of like a blend of business and engineering. Oh, gotcha. Um, mechanical engineering for the first two years, and then like junior, senior year, pushing more into business, sales, supply okay. chain management kind of classes. Nice. So something that you'll be able to use when you get out, you yeah. know, because it'll be like a marketable skill yeah. to have. That's cool. All right. So let's start off with... Um, so I, I don't know how familiar everybody is with the basic school, but it's usually six to seven months, roughly. Um, every Marine Corps officer has to go through the basic school for six to seven months to basically get all of the, the basic infantry skills in case you ever need to become a provisional rifle platoon commander for Marines when we go to war. Um, and that's one thing I think the Marine Corps does a really good job of is trying to get everybody kind of on at least somewhat of the same page so that they can lead Marines into battle if if we're called to to do something like that. So that's usually that's well, that is typically the beginning. The beginning phase for every officer is at the basic school in Quantico, Virginia. And then following that is what you just said, IOC or infantry officer course. Um, I've been told it's one of the most arduous courses in the Marine Corps by a lot of people. Uh, but also, I've I've been told that it is the the interesting thing I've heard from a lot of people is that the platoon that is left at the end of IOC is the most proficient platoon in the Marine Corps because of how uh, how focused the training is and how how serious they are about making sure you are ready to lead Marines in the infantry. Um, let's. I'd, I'd like to hear a little bit of your perspective on what it's like to go through the infantry officer course and, and like maybe how long it is, uh, what types of things you guys do while you're there, what kind of weapon systems you guys learn about, things like that. So I'll let you kind of like talk on a little bit. Yeah. So IOC was for sure the most difficult thing um, I've ever done in my life. Yeah. Um, you got to go through. So I guess like the whole, the whole purpose of IOC is to, cr- is to be, common infantrymen yeah so tbs is more of a school where you learn leadership through through the infantry style of yeah. leadership like using the infantry plot as a platform yeah but ioc is where you become an actual infantryman it's where you learn the procedures the techniques the tactics um specifically how to employ weapon systems how to employ marines a rifle squad a weapon squad or mm. a machine gun squad uh, Carl G. Yeah. Um, at IOC, the primary weapon systems that you're going to be focusing on is going to be the company grade weapon system. So anything okay. that's anything that's organic to an infantry company. So thinking top to bottom, you've got the 60 millimeter mortar system. You've got the Carl G. You've got AT4s, Law rockets, frag grenades, yeah. um, M320s, 240s, M27s. And then we did we did a little bit of familiarity with the AK forty seven and with okay. the M eighteen. Nice. But we didn't do any like live fire qualifications with it or anything. Yeah. Like it was just dis and ass basic familiarity 
Yeah. So Carl G is a recoilless rifle, yep. and it fires. Uh, you have thermobaric rounds, and you have a very various other types of uh, things. That, the Carl G is a relatively. It used to be mostly just soft. Had that stuff for the longest time. We didn't have Carl G's. We had Smalls when I was still in the infantry, and so they've changed. They've done away with Smalls a little bit, and now it's just Carl G's. Those are very versatile from what I've been told. Did you get to fire different types of ammunition for them other than just one or two? Yeah, so primarily we fired either HE or TP on okay. that IOC. And the primary reason for that for my class was because of the ammo allocations that we're getting due gotcha. to everything that's going on in the world. Yeah, yeah. Uh, ammo allocations are a little uh, shallow right now. Yeah. Um, it's a really, really cool weapon system, though. Yeah. Um, it for sure adds a lot of flexibility. And I think, like, the benefit of... It over the small is also some of the like the capabilities that the FCS, the optical system on it that it brings. Okay. So you can with a proficient gunner, you can accurately engage a target, like a tank size target, sure, out to eight hundred meters, which for a dismounted guy is for a dismounted good. guy, yeah. So me yeah. being rifle platoon commander, I'm thinking I can kill a tank now from yeah. eight hundred meters away. That's which cool. is which is something that's important for me to be thinking about important for the marines to know hey like we can handle this problem yeah ideally we'll never get there ideally right. we have the supporting agencies we have close air support we have deep air support we have people that are that are specifically there to kill that kind of vehicle before we even get there yeah but it's nice to know that we have that capability organic to us as well yeah that's huge having having organic capabilities that you know kind of give you you know, the versatility for whatever type of mission you get, whatever type of commander's intent you have, like that's, that's huge, you know, and it, pro it provides you as the commander more options, uh, more options, you know, for your planning, you know, mm. uh, having more options is always good because as we all know, like, you know, a plan, I know it's the most stereotypical thing ever, <laughs> but a pl what a plan never survives first contact, right? And you have to be able to be flexible. So it's, it's good for flexibility too. So, Okay, you said the M320 as well, I noticed. M320 is the new handheld 40-millimeter uh, 40 40 grenade launcher, right? And is that – I don't know as much about that because we only had 203s when I was in the infantry. So, And that's like – I think that's been done away with now, correct? We don't use those anymore? Yeah, so we, we just have M320s now. Um, primary difference is that it's not attached to the rifle. Okay. Um, there's advantages and disadvantages to it. It's not very fun to carry if um, you do have to carry it. Mm. Um, however, it's more accurate and you can have, you have more or better night capabilities with it. So okay. the GLS optic that's on it, you can ah. actually range, use it, uh, to adjust your range for the target. So you can actually engage target more accurately at night. Okay. Um, is that GLS is basically like kind of like a holographic site kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. And so you can, you can zero it. And then basically once you, once it's zeroed, wherever you're pointing it, it's like point of aim ideally point of impact as long as they're practicing the fundamentals of marksmanship kind of thing yeah okay that makes sense yeah i'll say that and i'll also say i do think like personally and from what i've seen with the like proficiency of the marines with the 320 is the fu marksmanship fundamentals are a little bit more difficult with the m320 than the 203 grenade launcher okay because the i mean basic marksmanship fundamentals but the trigger pull is much more difficult the is trigger it? is much heavier okay um and there's much more like pull, I guess, before the yeah. break in the trigger. More pounds per square inch required. Exactly. Per square. Yeah. Okay. And that, and that causes that makes it a little bit difficult to keep more difficult to keep on target. Yeah. Obviously, sets and reps mitigate that. Sure. And the Marines train to it all the time, but yeah. that's just what I've noticed that it's it's a little bit more uh, challenging. Okay. To practice the fundamentals of marksmanship with it. Makes sense. Okay, so um, you get to you get to use a lot of different types of weapon systems, get familiarized with them, learn how to employ them when you're in IOC. What, what's, what's, if you had to pick one thing in IOC, what was the most difficult thing in IOC for you personally? The most difficult thing to overcome? The difficult thing to overcome? I think it was just the, this, this is probably going to sound weird, but just the basics of being an infantryman. Okay. So, and obviously like, It's the, the amount of weight that's on your shoulders physically, mm -hmm. the amount of weight that's on your shoulders mental, mentally, spiritually, that you have to bear going into a field op for, or an extended operation for, say, two weeks or 10 days or whatever, where you're not getting any sleep, 
you're carrying a lot of weight. Um, and then there's a lot of high intensity things that happen throughout this. There's a lot of boredom, but also you're having to self-sustain yourself. You don't have any water, you don't have any food, and it's everything that you do is getting yourself to survive and anything that you fail to do is going to be why you suffer. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of, there's also a lot of physical challenges. The hikes were very difficult. Mm. Um, you had to carry a lot of loads. They're like backbreaking amounts of weights. I don't want to like give specific numbers, but you okay. can imagine between like 140 to 180, anywhere ranging from there. Yeah, that's a lot. On, depending on the hike, right? That's more than, he- <laughs> that's more than the heaviest pack I've ever carried. Yeah. That's heavy. It was, it's, it, it gets you to learn some things about yourself. Yeah. Yeah. You have like, I imagine you had some, yeah. cu- some come to Jesus moments. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. That's brutal. Yeah. How many, uh, are you allowed to say like what the furthest distance you think you went was? So my experience difference, it differs because the course changes from course to course. Okay. So for my experience, we had a 16 week course. Okay. I think it's shortening right now, um, to like 13 weeks. Maybe I'm not hundred percent sure. Okay. Um, and our furthest hike that we did was our furthest evaluated hike that we did was 12 miles, 12 miles, 12 miles. Okay. But you're also doing like patrol based operations and stuff like that. And you're probably walking far more than that with tons mm-hmm. of weight and constant not sleeping and not eating. And you know, what would you say? Like, what was the average amount of food you would, you would eat on a day in the field when you would go to the field, like one MRE, two MRE, three, that, that depends on the person. I was more of a, I can suffer in the field kind okay. of guy. So I would pack out probably two MREs per day. Okay. So, and that still ends up being 20 MREs, which is a lot of weight. If yeah. you're packing out for 10 days of operations. Yeah. Um, I know guys that brought four MREs per day and it was, Oh wow. I don't know how they did that to themselves. <laughs> but, it's a lot more weight, you know? Yeah. So I would do about two MREs and then I would try to pack like a little, you know, moto stack here or there to help sure. boost morale when, it, yeah. you know, it's, pouring rain on you and it's sure. 45 degrees out <laughs> yeah you gotta have some morale snacks in there yeah. like some i don't know skittles or whatever it is that exactly. you like hey this makes me gives me a little bit of happiness in this sad yeah. moment i'm in right now yeah no, I, I get that for sure uh so you did was most of most of the training was in in uh, quantico right yeah correct was there any other locations that you guys had to do evaluations at or anything so we went to 29 palms for palm fix which is not our culminating exercise, but the where everything kind of comes together, where the the weeks of building upon the fundamentals of what the procedures are for employing a Carl G, for employing a mortar system, for employing a machine gun si- system, all come together, and you do multiple platoon attacks and platoon clears and stuff like this, where it's you're actually applying all of the basic elements of the infantry into one coordinated effort yeah. uh, as a team, which is pretty cool. And then the other place uh, was West Virginia, which okay. was our culminating exercise. And that was unique because it's up in the mountains of West Virginia. So unique challenge with the mountains, like physically. Yeah. But then also we got to use some pretty cool technological systems. Like Saab Technologies gave us this laser system. It's similar to the ITES gear that most people are familiar with. Gotcha. But it was really cool because it actually painted like effects for you. So if you, it oh. had a little speaker on your shoulder. So it would tell you if you've been shot, where you got shot, how to respond to it. Like, hey, you need to get in the prone or it'll like start beeping at you, whatever. That's cool. And then it'll also paint mortar impacts. So if you take indirect fire, it'll say you'll, you're receiving mortar impacts 50 meters to your rear or 50 meters to the south or whatever. That's so, cool. So it's actually a really cool, really cool piece of gear and provided yeah. some high fidelity training and especially the after action where you got to see literally like each individual person, whether they were in the prone, in the kneeling, in the standing, where they were moving to and from, who they were engaging. It was pretty cool. That's, yeah, for those of you that don't know what ITES gear, ITES is like the older laser, kind of like laser tag system that we used to have, right? This is called what? Um, I don't know what the actual name of the system is, but I know it was done by Saab Tech. By Saab, yeah. So it's kind of the same. It, ultimately, it's like high-tech laser tag, but what you're saying is it's it is able to tell, paint you a picture of like, hey, this is the type of injury you just took. This is uh, what's going on right now. And th- that way it can provide you with information that you can then use to react to, whether it's like, hey, this person was shot le- left leg or something. It'll tell you that. Would it even tell you like what appendage was injured, injured and stuff? Okay, so that all goes into condu- you know conducting your 
tactical combat casualty care and things of that nature. And then you guys get reps at that and you get reps at doing a nine line Kazavak plan or Kazavak uh, report and all that stuff, calling it over the radio, coordinating with that, setting security, making sure that everybody is doing their job. And that just gives you an even better rep at just essentially just practicing, practicing how to war yeah. <laughs> really is what it is. You know, yeah. that's cool. Yeah. And I'll say like probably looking back, I think the coolest part about IOC was how, how well the instructors are able to like paint yeah. the picture in, in graded events. I think at TBS where typically you'd have maybe one instructor with a platoon or with a squad. Yeah. So they can't really paint effects. And when I say paint effects, I mean, um, if you're a squad and you get engaged with another squad and it's a force on force exercise yeah. and you're using blanks, you both just sit there and you shoot at each other and no one knows what to do because no one actually experiences the effects of what's going on. Like, I don't know if I'm being suppressed if they're shooting blanks at me and they don't, yeah. they don't know if they're being suppressed. I don't know who's dead or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So at IOC, what the instructors did a very good job on at providing a evaluator or an instructor at the point where that where it needed to be to provide those paints and to provide that feedback to the students as they were in a little like media engagement or an offensive or defensive att attack or defense yeah. yeah that's cool that, that that and that honestly like that's valuable stuff because like it's tough it's tough to portray you know certain given events happening live while there's like a bunch of chaos and there's like things happening and everybody's reacting in their own independent unique way based on they were trained and it is tough it's tough to create realistic training where you know you're able to say this is what's happening right now react to it make a decision on this particular scenario that I'm explaining to you or I'm telling you is happening yeah. and that's valuable because I mean Outside of that, the only other experience you can have is the real thing happening. And, like, obviously you want to be as prepared as possible before that happens. So that's good that they're they're taking that pretty serious out there, especially at that, that course. Um, so let's see. You, you How long was yours, you said? It was, like it was 16 weeks. 16 weeks. Okay, mm -hmm. so you go through the 16 weeks. You feel like you're, you're prepared to be a rifle platoon commander once you get out of there? I feel like you were incredibly prepared for – offensive defensive um block and tackle yeah like rifle platoon like in terms of the tactical employment of a rifle platoon yeah you're very well prepared um i will say like coming to the fleet as a new lieutenant is where you know a little bit of the hey this is how things actually work out here yeah like learning the little jots and tittles of like how the marine corps works and yeah who needs to go to what course how you keep track of people and where they're at how you help Marines get further in their careers, how you hold Marines accountable for doing things that are either illegal or immoral or whatever. Yeah. Um, and then how you also in that you change and adapt your platoon to how you want it to look like. Because, you know, your platoon that you get to as an infantry officer is your kingdom, you know, so... At TBS, they do a really good job of, te of telling us to trust our staff NCOs when we get to the fleet, which I think is a very important thing um, to trust your staff NCO, especially when it comes to learning the little admin in and outs of the Marine Corps. Yes. But something that could probably be hit on a little bit more is that your platoon is yours. Yeah. And like whenever you get there, it's your responsibility and all the things that you see that are wrong. It's on you to fix them because yeah. no one else is going to fix them for you. Yeah. So. Yeah. And that's when you can lean on your staff and CEO to help you do those yeah. things. You know, you can like communicate, be like, hey, these are some things that I've been seeing. Like, I would like this to get worked on or fixed or like um, because like there's certain lanes that you have and that they have. You're essentially like the, the team manager. Like you manage that is your team. Right. Exactly. And it's like that guy might be one of the coaches for your team, but you're, it's still your team. And like, but you're going to lean on the coach to help you out. Cause he's been with that team for a little bit, or he's had a lot of time with other various teams, you know? Yeah. Um, and definitely, especially with the admin stuff, cause they probably don't have a lot of time in IOC to teach all this other admin stuff outside of like war fighting, you know, cause you only have 16 weeks to work with each other and like yeah. learn all that, learn this vast amount of knowledge, you know, where, um, a lot of it's going to be learned on, you know, experientially, you know, yeah. because you have to get out there and like the way that a platoon of lieutenants in IOC would react and do things for are going to it's going to be different than a platoon where you've got some sergeants, some corporals, some lance corporals, some privates, mm -hmm. 
you know? And like, I'm sure that was probably a challenge, uh, kind of being able to take, take that step back and realize, okay, we've got work to do. That's fine. But Mm -hmm. we can, we can work through this and we can like learn, you know, how to work better with each other, um, by getting those reps in and getting the practice and, and learning and growing with each other, you know, uh, cause everybody else is going to be learning and growing just as you are, just as your staff and CEO is even. Yeah. Um, and you know, and at the end of the day, like, as long as you're, you're moving forward and you're not moving behind, like, as long as you got that forward progression, that's, that's a good thing, you know? Yeah. Um, what do you think, what do you think the most challenging part about being a platoon commander is so far, if you had to pick one thing specifically? Um, probably being taken away from the Marines mm-hmm. so much. Um, I think like being a rifle platoon commander is p- probably in the officer community, at least like from what I remember from TBS, like TBS is where you're taught how to be a Marine officer and it's in the format of a rifle platoon. Yeah. So it's what everyone's familiar with and it's what everyone wants to get to. Um, but then you get to the, the fleet and you kind of see how there are just things that need to get done. Um, I heard this saying is kind of is kind of funny, but I think it was pretty wise. It was uh, we can't train unless the parking lot is police called. <laughs> it's it's the way it is. It's the way it is, and that's yeah. okay. It's the Marine Corps. You yeah. know what I mean? Like that is that's okay. But yeah. Once we recognize that's how it is, we've got to adapt and we've got to adjust to it. And I think the hardest part was coming to the fleet thinking like, oh, I'm going to be a rifle platoon commander. I'm going to be able to like do a lot of offensive, defensive stuff. I'm going to learn how to get really good with this platoon. We're going to be a, we're going to be a team. We yeah. do. The Marine Corps is good about preparing you for deployment. I feel like we're like we're about to deploy and I feel like I've been had enough time to be with my guys that I feel prepared yeah. and I feel confident in my guys as well. But just thought that there would be more, you know. And I think that's everywhere you go in the Marine Corps though. Yeah. It's just yeah, so, so you re- you recognize the reality of the th- the day to day things and the importance of getting people to schools and that yeah. takes away f- people from you and you gotta provide taxes here. Yeah, yeah, I, that, some of the administrative stuff that you don't have any say in, and it's just like, hey, uh, we need two people for this working party, and they need to come from your platoon, and that's what your company commander told you or something. Like, well, it's like, well, okay, this is what we have to do. This yeah. is like this is the way it is, you know. Or uh, we need people for duty, you know, and uh, it's, you know, you have two sergeants and all the other sergeants are at school. Well, guess what? Your sergeants need to stay on duty this week. And then you're losing your sergeants to go stay on duty while you needed them for training or something like that. And then you just have to find, you've, you, have, you got to find ways to navigate it and find ways where you say, okay, can I accomplish both this task that's coming down from higher and also accomplish uh, this training that I'm trying to, you know, get done for my platoon to make us better and more proficient, mm-hmm. you know, and just learning to navigate. And I think part of that is just like adapting to your environment and like being able to make quick decisions and being able to just like be like, okay, let's find a way to make this work, you know, because that's, I think that's beneficial to just life in general, mm-hmm. you know, finding a way to work, to find a, ma- a way to make it work. And probably if you're going out on missions or you're doing real life stuff or you're on a deployment and you've got stuff you have to do and things that have to get done, like finding a way to accomplish the goal, finding a way to accomplish the mission, finding a way to meet the commander's intent, you know, regardless of all this extraneous stuff that's going on, you know, so it's just like, I think it's valuable experience regardless. It, it is tough and it, and I do understand your frustration in that piece mm-hmm. because we all see it. I think everybody sees it no matter what what your MOS is or what your billet is or mm. you know, I'm sure that your your captain probably feels that kind of pressure sometimes too coming from above because there's things that have to happen that he has to make sure are facilitated, you know. And I'm sure that even the battalion commander runs into that stuff. It's like, hey, you've got to give up this many people from your battalion for the fleet assistance program and that's it. That's the that's the way it is. Mm. And he's like, Roger, I got it. We'll take care of it. You know what I mean? And that and it gets done. But it's like it's frustrating because you have to like flex and you have to change things and maybe you had plans and like your plan didn't go as planned. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but yeah, just I think being flexible is probably one of the most beneficial things that people can learn It's in life. You know, yeah. just being able to adjust and find a way to make things work. Um, I think it's always it's always valuable. So let me ask you this. What kind of, so you guys, how often do you think you go to the field in the infantry right now? So right now, because we're about to kick out of here, we're we're about to spend a whole month without going to the field. Okay. Um, 
on the average during, normally on the, on the average normally i'd probably say like once every three weeks and it would typically be four days okay on average so like you'd be field op for four days back for maybe a week to two weeks yeah and either that second week you're going back out again or you're preparing for another one the week after the second, so the third week away. Okay, so a lot of planning going on for that, the future yeah. operations and stuff like that. Yeah. And that, that is one of the best parts about being a platoon commander, though, is that you're constantly focused on training. Yeah. Um, especially when you're in a workup or you're back from a deployment, you're yeah. getting ready for a deployment, you're not necessarily in a workup yet. It's yeah. just your job as a rifle platoon commander is to train the Marines. Yeah. Which is a pretty cool job. Yeah, and then B, I think... One of the cool things that I would imagine, if, if I had to guess what it's like for you being an infantry officer, I would imagine that being able to be the guy that's making those plans and designing what types of training you're going to do uh, is like empowering, you know, because you can pick, okay, you know, it's up to you like to decide, okay, what are our weaknesses right now? What do we need to work on? Are we good at, are we good at room clearing? No. Okay. Well then we should, we should plan some some uh some mount training or mm. uh we maybe we should get some grenade throwing training in because we haven't done that this year or um maybe we need to plan you know we we need to get more reps practicing working in in conjunction with the machine gun team so that way we can get practice on working bilaterally with other people mm. um and just like different things like that and or orders like writing orders like maybe we should maybe we need to get some reps on like our squad leaders writing or reading orders or briefing orders or leading people on patrols or whatever it is and you being able to have that you know creative control over what it is that your platoon's doing mm -hmm. uh that's got to be empowering for sure and uh, i know that you probably enjoy that i know a lot of my other friends that are doing the same gig they they love that about being the the platoon commander they have a lot of creative control over things yeah um what what kind of training do you guys do typically when you're in the rear, like in garrison, for example, and you're not in the field? Like, what kind of training can you guys do? Um, typically in garrison, because the space is the most limited, we yeah. try to stick to fundamentals, so like brilliance and the basic stuff. Sure. Um, basic patrolling, basic rim clearing, basic offensive, action left, action right, whatever. Do, doing classes. Um, okay. On maybe current events, things like that. Doing classes on convoy patrols getting prepared to do maybe the convoy simulator is something we are oh, doing nice. in the next couple weeks which will be cool those are good um, have you guys yeah. done the convoy simulator yet uh, i have not done oh it's a good one yeah, uh, yeah convoy sim we used to do it a lot because i was in cat so like mm -hmm. we always do the convoy sim because that's like what we do but that's it, like i think that's super valuable for for the the line companies specifically because mm -hmm. they don't get to have that mounted time like everybody else does but a lot of times people are gonna be mounted if you're like in an austere, you're not walking 30 miles. No. There's no way that you could do that and be combat effective. So yeah. like, I think that's valuable. That's cool. So combat simulator or convoy simulator, you guys go outside, just like do some like spot, like on the off the cuff patrolling, like mm. random patrolling exercises in the yard and stuff. Yeah. So something that we try to do is that maybe to try to provide a little bit more fidelity, like we'll paint things here and there. We'll like set a squad in the defense, put a squad in the offense. So okay. they're like kind of, Thinking against each other a little bit. Yeah. I will say because it's day-to-day -day training, you do not have the amount of time to prepare for it as, like, a school would. Sure. So the fidelity of the training isn't as high as IOC or as the advanced schools or yeah. as even SOI in general. Sure. Um, but you still get to practice the sets and reps, which is important. And I think the one of the coolest things about the infantry is everyone agrees on that. Okay. Everyone, even the even the most junior Marines, everyone understands that rehearsals and the sets and reps are the most important thing, and is willing to do that. Some some are a little less willing to get sets and reps than others. Sure. But everyone knows how important it is, so you don't have to argue about why. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's just a ge just a general level of understanding that people get. It's like, look, you, you know, if you want to become better at being, you know. If you want to get better at playing video games, well, guess how you're going to get better at playing video games? By playing video games. You know, mm -hmm. if you want to get better at building rockets, you're going to have to build some rockets first, yeah. you know? Same thing for patrolling or same thing for Kazavak drills. Like, if you want to get better at doing Kazavak drills, you have to do Kazavak drills. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's that's good that they're mostly on board with that kind of stuff. I think, And I think at the end of the day, like, 
that builds more esprit de corps, more camaraderie, because the more guys are doing stuff with each other and like working with each other rather than sitting in their rooms and like kind of waiting for word or something like that, it's going to be better. It, it, and it makes the day go by faster too, rather than, you know, waiting on like, oh man, we're just waiting to get off work. We don't know what's going on kind of thing, which I'm sure that happens still occasionally because it's like you can't help it sometimes. Like, and that that does happen. Yeah, it's like it's, <laughs> it's like it's because word sometimes word mm -hmm. takes a long time to trickle down to you even or even to the captain and like we're just trying to figure out what's happening or like hey what's the intent for today or you know um, but then there's also like you know the that that also could be one of those times where it's like empowering the NCOs to be like hey look while we're waiting for word to get past let's all go in the let's all go in the conference room we'll kick a little hip pocket class on whatever you know. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, view, we could do vehicle identification if we want, whatever it is, mm -hmm. like just we'll kick a little class uh, or we could do some cross training with somebody from weapons company and learn something about their MOS real quick. They could just come talk about something real quick. We can just like figure something out, um, you know, and that's good because like, you know, NCOs being empowered to to be in control, that kind of stuff helps a lot, too, because it gives them some flexibility and give, provides them the opportunity to lead and teach and mentor uh, the junior guys as well. You know, I think. The infantry does a very good job of teaching leadership from from the top all the way down. Like teaching teaching a private how to lead his peers is valuable, you know. And not everyone else gets that same that same type of experience. And I've I've seen there's big differences between you know infantry MOSs and non infantry MOSs in regards to like teaching leadership. And I, there is a very valuable thing to that, like especially just in life and in general. Mm -hmm. um, and I do, I have a very deep appreciation for that, for that piece is like, you know, and that goes back to like desegregated or uh, decentralized command stuff, because like it should be, you, you should be able to lead all the way down to the lowest guy. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's super valuable. So um, what's the thing that you enjoy the most? If you had to pick one thing that you enjoy the most about being an infantry platoon commander. Offensive attack. Offensive is attack my, is my favorite thing. Whenever okay. we do an infantry platoon, like range. That's, okay, this is like we did the infantry platoon battle course range twenty one, um, at Bar Fort Barfoot, Virginia. Okay, and that was recently. That, yeah, it was a couple of months ago. And okay, that was, that was my favorite thing that I've done as a platoon commander. I guess th in terms of things that you do, yeah, um, that was that's my favorite thing. Yeah, in terms of just being an officer is getting to see and like yeah i think just getting to see how 0311s and 0331s and like all of, all of the marines just are yeah like they're really they're really unique and cool people um and it's crazy the resilience oh yeah that these guys have um the story the story that comes to mind for me is when we were we did, we were doing a patrolling exercise we get out there. We started with a with a uh, mounted attack. Okay. We do the attack. We kick straight into patrolling after that. So we've been in the field for about twenty four hours, and someone loses a piece of serialized gear. Oh, so classic. The next eighteen hour, and it happened right at the beginning of nightfall. Right? Yeah. Oh, worst so time. Worst time. Start ever. immediately. Police calling. Yeah. From night call. To Online night. white yep. lights. Yep. For probably like 12 hours of this training <laughs> exercise and no one's had food or water yet because or sleep because we started <laughs> and these guys are just sitting there like smiling like cracking jokes like yeah. in a good time and it's like anyone else would sit in this situation and just be like frustrated like i was i was sitting there frustrated because i'm like we're missing out on training right now we're only in the field for like you're only in the field for a little bit of time yeah you need field time is valuable yeah um but like seeing seeing their attitude changed my attitude because I was sitting there being grumpy about yeah how we're not training, but it's just cool that Marines can go through can do stuff like that and just be happy. I love it. Um, and there's I'm sure there is more. That like, that's a small like surface scratch. Sure, the kinds of stuff that they have to deal with and they have to go through and they still keep a good positive attitude, um, for the most part. And you know like every Marine's different, but sure I think for like. The typical 0311, 0331, they get put through the ringer in some oh, ways, yeah. especially oh, yeah. physically, and they just do it with a smile on their face. Yeah. It's really cool. You know, uh, there was a, 
I can't remember. I think it's the British Royal Marines. They have, I don't know if it's a leadership trait or something like that, but cheerfulness Mm -hmm. is a thing that they talk about. Like cheerfulness is like, I think it's like a leadership trait or something like that that they talk about. Because when you're in the field and you're in the suck and you're just like hating life and your life is miserable and you're getting rained on, you're hungry, angry, you're tired, you know, and you're just like disgusting because you haven't showered in two weeks or whatever. That cheerfulness goes a long way. I mean, like you, I, that makes me think of like all those videos of like these dudes in the trenches out in like Western Europe or Eastern Europe right now. And like somehow there's guys out there probably in, you know, similar mental states where they're just like, oh man, my life, this is like awful. But they're with their boys and they're like, you know, they laughing and joking and trying to have a good time or find, find something good in the, in the terrible situation you're in, you know? And I think that's, that is an admirable trait, especially for infantrymen. Cause you're just like, when you're in a miserable crap situation and all of these other environmental factors are impacting you, yeah, you could be like Mr. Grumpy and like sitting on the ground eating your MRE because you're sad and stuff and you got the big sad. Or you could just be like, you know what? This is just Marine Corps. Like, yeah, we're going to we're going to do this, whatever. And you joke, make jokes with your boys and, you know, uh, make whatever, you know, and that's that's. I know I know exactly like I can visualize that because I've seen the same thing in different times and places and it, i i can think back and remember that kind of stuff so um valuable valuable experiences and these are things that even when they get out or if they get out one day they'll remember that you know they'll remember that experience of there's just this shared misery and we're all here and like we're looking for this whatever serialized piece of gear and um you know eventually found it or we didn't find it but we were like up it was you fun. guys remember when we didn't fun. sleep for like two <laughs> days and we were disgusting and like we we're walking around police call white lights and the lieutenant was freaking out because he couldn't find the serialized gear or whatever yeah but that these are things these are like memories that they'll hold on to forever and they'll tell people about them and stuff like that you know yeah. um okay so how often do you get to so you're in a you're in a line platoon right you're in uh i think what bravo beowulf yep. beowulf, beowulf company yep. okay and do you, how often do you get an opportunity to cross train with like the weapons platoon, for example? So right now we actually have weapons platoon has come to the rifle platoon. So we have our attachments for the really? deployment. Oh, yeah. gotcha, gotcha. Okay. But normally um, it's not like that, right? Yeah. Normally it's not like that. Um, probably once every two to three weeks, maybe we'd typically be like, Hey, let's put the 11s through some gun drills or something. Nice. Um, especially with like the Carl G. Yeah. Because that's something that every 0311 should have at least some level of proficiency with. Yeah. But the way that our battalion has broken it up is we're going to essentially like have people who are designated Carl G gunners. Okay. So they're like the SMEs of the Carl G. Yeah. Um, but getting those guys who are with weapons platoon or the SMEs of the Carl G also to like train the, the typical 0311 so they can use it as well. Yeah. Yeah, I, ha- I think having, like, familiarization is good for everything. Like, one of the things they used to talk to us about in CAD is everybody should know how to do everybody else's job mm-hmm. in the truck. So, like, if you got a vehicle commander, you got a driver, a gunner, a uh, guy in the back, uh, everybody should know how to do everybody else's job. So if somebody gets taken out of the fight, somebody else can pick that slack up and immediately carry on with the f- carry on with the mission, right? Yeah. I think there's value in that for sure. Um, it it aids you with more flexibility, you know, when it comes down to whatever mission set you have, uh, definitely a valuable, valuable thing to do. Do you guys get to work with weapons company at all? Um, yes. So probably not as frequently, but during the past four months or so, I would say we've worked with them a good amount in terms of company level events, company level raids, okay, platoon offensive, uh, ranges, sure. stuff like that. We've got to integrate with them and they do they do a pretty good job, and I think they get worked pretty hard too. Yeah, especially because there's only one cat. You know? Yeah, <laughs> like yeah, yeah. There's only one, cat. and they gotta work with everybody. And if we're doing a platoon range that nine rifle platoons are going through, that cat has got to support nine platoon attacks in a row. Oh, for or more more than likely, it's probably like forty platoon attacks because yeah. everyone's got to do dry run day, dry run night, yeah, live run day, live run night. So 
And it's a lot of runs. Yeah, it's a lot of runs. <laughs> <laughs> they get it worked. But. They could, do you guys do damp? I don't know what, if you ever heard of the term damp run. What is yeah. a damp run? For um, those, of, those of us that don't know, just essentially no rounds, just the pyro. Okay, right. So right. for like signal plans. Or yeah, whatever. I think dry run and and wet run people kind of get an idea for that, but people hear the term damp and they're like, "What does that mean?" You're like, yeah. "Moist? Are you um, doing a <laughs> moist run?" Did you take it's a like, no, dip we're, yeah, did you, yeah. Did you take a dip in the pool before you did? No, no. It just means you're using pyro. So that's, uh, yeah, that's funny. But yeah, that's that's um, weapons company, man. They 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 have their work cut out for them. There's only one. I mean, they're a battalion asset. You know, like the the snipers, they're a battalion asset. Cats, a battalion asset. Eighty ones, battalion asset. Especially for fires. You know, um, do you guys ever get any reps or get to practice call for fire as the platoon at all? Um, yes, it's, but it's typically just like, this is what call for fire is. Okay. Practice call for fire. Yeah. Um, that's a tough thing to learn, man. It's it's hard to get good at call for fire. That's a very tough thing to get good at. Yeah. You know, um, there's like simulators and stuff, but typically that's more used for the fist. Um, uh, people like JFOs and kind of stuff are you out there now the fist leader is typically a lieutenant, right? Mm -hmm. Is that like. Uh, is it usually the weapons platoon lieutenant? Yes. So okay. the weapons platoon commander is also the fist, which is the fire support team leader. And okay. the fire support team is essentially a the fist himself. So yeah. the lieutenant, it is a representative from 81s. It okay. is a representative from the wing. So whether that's a JTAC or a FAC. Gotcha. Um, and then there's like JFOs as well, and then yeah. the, it's kind of up to the commander's discretion on how he wants the fist to look like. But that's pretty much like the fundamental. Yeah, FAC stuff. is forward air controller, right? Correct. And then JTAC is joint, uh, joint tactical tactical air controller. I believe so. Is that right? Yeah, we and they're usually uh, like a captain or something like that, typically, right? So a FAC would be a captain, and then the JTAC. Um, our JTAC was a corporal. Corporal. Mm. Interesting. A yeah. Corporal JTAC. Yeah, so... That's a tough course, the JTAC course. Yeah. I don't know. I I went to... So I, I had to do the JFO or the JTAC primer because I was mm-hmm. going to go to JFO. And I ended up getting dropped because they didn't have enough room for me. Mm-hmm. But, we, man, that primer is brutally hard. Like I And I know that the course is very difficult, too. So I can't imagine if JFO is very hard. I imagine the JTAC course is probably extremely in-depth. Yeah. Like learning how to do... You know, suppression of enemy air defense, like CAD missions, learning how to do all the different various types of call for fire, like polar, grid, all that stuff, like, and knowing it like it's the back of your hand, like, mm. again, it just goes back to call for fire is hard. It's not easy. You gotta, you gotta be, you know, you gotta be uh, on your game. Yeah, I feel like call for fire is one of those things that people take it, especially like in in the infantry level, like at yeah. the rifle platoon level, like we take it, okay, this is a solution to a problem, yeah. but that's kind of how we look at it, whereas yeah. fires is actually like an art form. There's right. so many different ways to yeah. th- think about employing artillery or cast and how you employ them, how you coordinate them together, coordinate it a loom, yeah. um, how you mark targets, yeah. how you how you talk on to a pilot where the target is yeah all this crazy. how you're speaking to him over the radio yeah yeah it, it's huge it's, it's 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 a lot um we don't we don't like get that much exposure but it's it's something to have a lot of respect for for sure no, for sure that group yeah i'm not a fist leader but mad respect for the fist leaders yeah. within the battalion is that something you'd ever be interested in trying to do or attempting to do um I kind of like being a rifle platoon commander. Okay, so. I feel you. No, I get, it. I get, it. I get it, man. Like you know, you've you've gained a passion for it. You know, yeah. you like being with the guys out there, like running and gunning. And, you know, I get it. Yeah. Um, have you guys? You guys went to ITX at all? Uh, no, we did not go to. ITX. You didn't go to ITX. Yeah. Have you been? You went to Twenty Nine Palms before for Palm Fex, right? Mm-hmm. So, range four hundred. You. Are you? Do you think you're going to have an opportunity to ever do range four hundred? Uh, with your unit, is that something you think you, you guys are going to have an opportunity to do at some point down the road? Me as a rifle platoon commander, probably not. Probably not. But maybe as a captain, maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, I think more. More. If it was going to happen, I'd probably be a company XO. Okay. Weapons okay. company or something. Yeah. Man, I tell you, like that's something I I want. Ev- you know, 
I've only done one range 400 because I've only ever had the opportunity to do it once as cat. And we supported one of the line companies to do the attack, the company attack there. But that is like the pinnacle of, of like infantry training for like everybody, you know, all across the board. And if it goes smoothly, it's just like, it's like a symphony of destruction. It's absolutely amazing. Like everything from coordinating this, you know, this, the snipers and the Ford observers to, you know, the long range fire or the deep fires to the short range fires, the engineers, the, you know, the, the machine gun suppression for the maneuver element and all that stuff, man, it is, it is pretty incredible to see, like, especially if it's done well. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm sure you guys have had lots of o- other opportunities to do very similar types of events in mm-hmm. different locations. Um, but it's definitely it's definitely a sight to see. I hope that you get to see it one day, um, like as you know, in, you know, with with a company that's actually doing it, you know, yeah. outside of outside ISC. Um, so uh, how long have you been in the Marine Corps for now? Um, just under two and a half years. So two and a half. OK. Yeah, so I commissioned December of 2021, and gotcha. the the training pipeline for me happens to be pretty long. Okay. Um, so if you're, so I went to OCS, graduated OCS, come back to finish one more semester of college. Ten weeks. Uh, yes. Okay, ten weeks. weeks. Yeah. Graduate, go. Essentially, I did PTAD for a the OSO there to just like help run the like PT for the recruiter. Yeah, off at the officer selection office. Okay, and then went to TBS. So after four months of being commissioned, I was at TBS. Yeah, TBS was about like six and a half to seven months. Finished TBS, had like a three month gap before IOC started. Oh, wow. then IOC was four months. Okay. So it ended up being a little like a pretty long pipeline before actually getting to the fleet. Yeah. Yeah, that's that is. I mean, the officer pipeline for that is is pretty extensive. I mean, you're going through a lot of training, but that's just. I think that's partially just because there's such a high level of responsibility, and like the demand is so high for lieutenants. Like, a uh, you know, a second lieutenant in the Marine Corps has a lot of responsibility. I don't know what it's like to be a lieutenant in any of the other branches. Um, so I can't really speak on that, but I know that it, lieutenants in the Marine Corps have an immense amount of responsibility, especially if you're becoming a rifle platoon commander right out the gate. Like that's, that's a lot. I mean, you all of a sudden have like, how many people are in your platoon? Um, right now it's 38. 38. So you're responsible for 38 souls. Mm-hmm. You know, that's, that's a lot. Mm-hmm. You know, it, you know, it, this is one of the nuanced pieces is like learning how to, Outside of the training, outside of the, you know, the workup, outside of the deployment stuff, like dealing with family stuff, you know, dealing with stuff that's personal life stuff. Like there, you know, people that are married, people that are, you know, needing to take leave to go see family, people that get sick, people that get injured, Mm -hmm. um, people that are having, you know, personal issues going on in their own life. They need to talk to somebody like you can be almost like a parental figure to some of these people because because in the marine corps we got people that come from all walks of life some of them came from broken homes some of them came from you know some of them might have lived with their grandparents they may have not had their parents you know mm-hmm. some of them might not have had a father some of them might not have had a mother some of them might come from the inner city some of them might come from the country mm-hmm. you know you got people from all walks of life and you got to find a way to take this hodgepodge of dudes and dudettes right and like find a way to bring everybody together so that you mesh well and work well together. And that's a lot. That's a lot of responsibility, you know, um, especially because, like, you know, in my mind, at least, like, I look at it like this is this is like my an extension of my family, yeah. you know, and I want to make sure they're good. I want to make sure that their personal life is good. Like, do you guys, you know, do you have enough money if you're living out in town to, to buy to put food on the table um, are you guys, you know, getting out of the barracks enough and going and doing stuff? Are you spending time with each other? Are you, you know, able to have time to go work out? Cause obviously like in the, you know, I don't I mean, every part of the Marine Corps, like mm. I think Marines overall typically tend to be more physically inclined than mm. other branches. And that's maybe that I'm biased. I feel like mo- most of us like to kind of get jacked and tan, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, that's just kind of, and maybe that, I mean, maybe that's part of the infantry is just like that mindset. It's like, we're trying to be warriors. We're trying to be jacked. We're trying to be yeah. like strong human beings and be capable and dependable. Um, but there's just a lot that goes into that. Like, what's something that you think is, is a, 
is a difficult part of that whole like personal life stuff for you? What's been a challenge in that in that realm? Um, there's been, yeah, without been, any specific yeah. information, but yeah, you know, so not not being specific, you you hit it on the head, you hit the nail on the head when you said you come to a very very diverse group of people with very very unique problem sets that you've never experienced before. Probably. Yeah, at least for me, I'm coming from upper middle class, yeah, like typical American raising up, like yeah. So I've got my experience, right, and how I've seen my worldview. Sure. I mean, just seeing the very, very diverse, completely unique backgrounds. You have people that maybe aren't even U.S. citizens. You have people that don't really have family relationships. You have people that have dealt with things that, like, you might not have been exposed to. Right. Um, before coming to the Marine Corps. Mm. Um, and you've got, yeah, and I think, like, one thing is the the mental health thing. Yeah. Really, really important. Mm -hmm. um, that's just something that I think is very, very prominent for especially young men yeah. in kind of an age where I think men need a mission. Yeah. You know? That's just my worldview. Sense um, of purpose. Yeah. Sense of purpose. Sense of purpose is important. Mm -hmm. And the Marine Corps does a good job of providing purpose. Yeah. But sometimes if men just get left alone in the barracks for too long, yeah, like you were saying, you got to check up on them and make sure yeah. they're doing stuff. And something that, like, I don't claim to be better than any platoon commander, but, like, for my guys, I like to, like, talk to them about life. Like, I have, one of my, like, worldviews is I'm a, I'm a very strong Christian. Okay. Um, so I don't, like, throw Christianity in their face or anything like sure. that. But I, like, family values are very important to me. So Mine too. Like, to talk about, hey, what does it mean to be a man as a husband or yeah. as a father because maybe some of us haven't had that yeah is a good example before yeah um, and i think like recognizing that because you know maybe maybe we have, as officers haven't even seen that before but it's something that's important for people to know and people to like understand and to seek self-improvement and yeah know yourself and seek self-improvement yeah is a huge thing um the knowing yourself part's hard sometimes yeah you know because Oftentimes, human beings have a very difficult time making accurate self-appraisals, mm -hmm. you know, because ego can get in the way or maybe they just didn't have the mentorship to teach them how to do that. Because, like, that doesn't come naturally, you know, like mm -hmm. we're human beings are weird, man. You know, it is uh, we're very complex, you know, very complex. And especially when you're working in an environment where you have like, you know, like you said, 30 some odd people. Um, and you probably feel responsible for those individuals mm -hmm. and you feel obligated to make sure that they are, you know, not only becoming better warfighters, but, um, growing, maturing, mm -hmm. um, getting better at managing life, you know, because you want to see them go off to be successful regardless if they stay in or get out, yeah. you know, and that is a, that is a very difficult thing to navigate, especially, I mean, how old are you now? I'm 25, 25, six in a couple days. Yeah. So like as a, you know, as a young man, like it's, it's a very, that is a lot of responsibility to have on your, on weighing on your soul. And it's not that you, you came into it not knowing that there was a lot expected, mm -hmm. you know, I'm sure that you had, a, you had a, a sense of like, I'm entering into an undertaking that is significant and is going to be a significant part of my life for the rest of my life, regardless of if I stay in or get out. Um, but I'm sure that it's also very rewarding yeah. as well, you know, because you get to see these guys grow up, you get to see them mature, you get to see them improve, mm -hmm. you get to see them be successful, even if they get out. Yeah. Um, you know, have you, if you say, what, what's been the most difficult piece of just the whole being, being like the, the team, the team captain, if you will, like what's the most difficult part? So I think one of the most difficult and one of the most important parts is being a person who's able to hold Marines accountable. Yeah. Um, Obviously, like when you're a brand new lieutenant, that's not what you should be focused on. You should be focused on learning and yeah. getting 
getting kind of a rhythm and, and working with your staff and CEO for things. Yeah. But it's hard to love people, like see these guys that you love a lot, but then if they do something that you know is is wrong and it's it's not just it's let's say not wrong in the way that like oh they're like being doing something illegal yeah let's say they're not doing a rehearsal and instead they're eating chow when you know they haven't rehearsed stuff and they're not ready to execute the range that they're about to do it's being the one who has to stand up and say hey like i love you guys but we're not done yet like yeah you guys are being lazy right now yeah you know um calling people on their bs exactly yeah and that's like i think everyone is uncomfortable with that. Yeah. There are people who have done it who have are more practiced at it than others. Sure. But everyone's uncomfortable with it. Yeah. As a leader, that's something that you have to get comfortable with. Especially yeah. like as a team captain, you have to be comfortable being like, these are my guys and I love them, but I need to call them out for yeah. whenever they're doing stuff that is going to either jeopardize their training, jeopardize their morality, or jeopardize their just financial situation like any yeah. anything like that you yeah. know like it's it's just yeah having the courage to hold people accountable yeah i think it you know communication is probably such such an important part of all that too like mm. uh having that open communication open line of communication with everybody and being able to be brutally honest with people even if it's uncomfortable um that's one of the hardest parts about being a leader i think is being capable of of that of eloquently communicating things without seeming like you're berating people, but also making sure that it's like a stern understanding, almost like, you know, your father would when it's like, you know, you didn't wash dishes when I told you to this morning, did you? Yeah. And it's like, no, dad, I didn't wash dishes this morning when you told me to. Um, and obviously that's different. That's like a, just a, just a, yeah. you know, as a reference, but yeah, I get it. That's, it's tough because you love these guys. You want to see them win. You want to see them su- be successful. You want to see them crush it out there. Um, but you know, you also got to make sure that the, the standards are uphold, up, yeah. upheld in, in everything, whether that be like, you know, legally or training wise or otherwise, but, mm-hmm. um, yeah, it's a tough thing to navigate. Uh, leadership is hard. Mm-hmm. Like real good leadership is hard. I think Jocko probably talked about that on his podcast and I'm not, I'd even like, I just thought about that. Like, I think I've heard one of his podcasts saying that leaders, like good leadership is real hard. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't claim to be good at it by any means i am like a novice you know i just tried to do the best i can um just like everybody else does you know but um i think that i think the most important piece of the whole thing really to the like life in general is just to remain teachable you know Mm -hmm. even if you're a lieutenant a captain a major a lieutenant colonel a colonel a general remaining teachable but you can learn something from a pfc Mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying Mm -hmm. i'm sure you have learned something from pfcs like that you might not have known before Um, and just staying humble, staying, you know, keeping that, maintaining humility, um, and, and remaining teachable, you know, because I'm not always going to have the answers to everything. There's no way I could possibly know everything. And I'm definitely not the subject matter expert on most things. You know, I might know a little bit about a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, but also I think it's important to know, like, it's okay to ask for help. Yeah. Two. I'm sure you've probably had to lean on your staff and CEO for things, right? Oh yeah, yeah. all the time. Yeah, all the time. Yeah, because it's like you're, there's no way you could know everything, especially mm-hmm. not when you first take the seat. Like, it's like you were talking about the admin stuff. Like, hey, what do we need to do for like what? What do I? How do I do this? How do I Excel document? You know what I'm saying? Like, mm-hmm. how do I PowerPoint presentation for con ops? Like, you know, what do mm-hmm. I do for this? You know, um, and that's a whole other piece of the planning that you get to, once you get good at it, then you can just pump con ops out and just fire them off over at the CEO so he can take a look at them and be like, yeah, this looks good. Yeah, good luck. Have, have fun out there. You know, yeah. let me know if everything's okay. Like, what well, you know, whatever, you know. Um, but, yeah, well, you know, I think, I think that overall it sounds to me like this has been a really rewarding experience for you. Would you say that's accurate? Yeah, I can't imagine doing anything else in the Marine Corps. That's what I tell my guys is I joined the Marine Corps to be a rifle platoon commander. Yeah. And that's it. (laughs) That's what I want. Well, and that's that's the people I want doing that job anyway, man. People that want to be there, you know. Mm -hmm. People that got that vested interest in the success of that occupation, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, 
and people that have passion, you know, having passion is, is huge. Yeah. Um, if you don't have, if you don't have passion for being a piano, a pianist, you're mm. probably not going to be the greatest pianist. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so I yeah. guess the same thing could probably be said about any profession, whether it be a profession of arms or, uh, being a saxophone player or being yeah. an actor or whatever it is, you know? Um, but you know, I, Look, I appreciate you taking the time um, to come here and talk with me about this this gig and this mm. this 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 thing that you've embarked upon. Um, being an O three O two an infantry officer that's a huge deal, man. And that is a there's a there's a burden of responsibility involved with that. Um, but uh, there's a burden of responsibility for that. Okay. But uh, you know, it sounds like. Overall, the whole thing's been very rewarding and that you've gained a lot from it. You've probably learned more than you could have ever imagined you would learn in this short period of time that you've been there. Yeah. Um, and for anybody else out there that's interested in leading Marines uh, and leading infantrymen and, you know, interested in this profession of arms in any way, I hope that they see this and maybe get something to something of benefit from hearing your perspective and your stories. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think I think some people will. I do. I think that some people, somebody out there, will see this, and they'd be like, "That sounds like a really cool job." Yeah. Let me look into this. Just, Let me see what more I can find out about this thing. Yeah. So again, I appreciate your time. Yeah. It means a lot. Um, I know you got a lot going on. You took your time on the weekend to come talk to me, Joe Schmo, <laughs> random schmuckatelli, you know, uh, in this VFW. Um, post 9983 so i need to thank them for allowing us to use their facility for this um but yeah yeah, yeah thanks for you having me it's been fun There's yeah only one other thing i enjoy talking about more and that's god but <laughs> okay and fair <laughs> enough fair enough but fair enough man this, this is awesome it's yeah. so much fun i'm glad we got to talk about it well I, I appreciate you taking the time man it means a lot and i think a lot of people will benefit from this so yeah, yeah. in any case we'll see you for the next video see ya